I'm John Volker. I'm editor of Green Car Reports, and I'm here with the 2011 Chevrolet Volt, which is one of the first of a new generation of electric cars coming to America's roads. Electric cars, or plug-ins, are one of the ways that we're going to be driving greener in the years and the decades to come. Every Chevrolet Volt comes with a charger that you can use when you want to recharge it wherever you are. This is a standard plug that will charge any electric car at all, any modern electric car. And on the other end of this is your basic three-prong that plugs into the wall. Charging this way, which you can do anywhere that has electricity, if the battery is fully depleted, takes mm, eight hours, plus or minus. Now, we're charging up front on 240 volt power. That only takes about three hours to charge the same battery pack. But the goal really is to charge your electric car in the wee hours of the morning when there is a ton of excess capacity for the power companies and it doesn't put a load on the grid. The Volt is what they call a range extended car, which means it has a battery pack and you ride all electrically, but it also has an engine in case you want to go 300 miles. The only thing this engine does is turn a generator that creates electricity and flows it to the electric motor underneath that actually runs the car. These cars have lithium-ion batteries here in the middle of the Chevy Bolt, down the uh, tunnel, and underneath the rear seat, there's a 300-pound T-shaped lithium-ion battery pack. That technology was not available at an automotive scale 10 years ago. Now it is. The basic thing that the vehicle control computer is doing here is figuring out how can I do what the driver is asking in the most energy efficient way. Traveling at 50 miles an hour, it takes more energy to heat the cabin on a cold day than it does to keep the car going at 50 miles an hour. They have seat heaters in this car. You can turn each side on. The Swedes, who spend a lot of time being really cold, um, have studied Cab perceptions of cabin temperature and what they found out is in fact if your hands are warm and your butt is warm you feel warm even if the rest of the car isn't and that's a much more energy efficient way to condition the cabin or condition the occupants than using resistance heaters to fill the entire cabin full of warm air. At the beginning of 2011 where we are now there are maybe 5,000 plug-in vehicles on the roads of North America. When you get to 2013, then all of a sudden, you've got 150,000 Leafs being made in Tennessee. You've got 120,000 Volts being made in Michigan. All of a sudden, you're getting to hundreds of thousands of plug-ins a year, and they'll be coming from other manufacturers as well. And we start to see whether we'll be able to achieve President Obama's goal of having a million plug-in vehicles on the road by the end of 2015. Even if we don't get to the million goal exactly, and J.D. Power, the respected auto analyst, said we'll get to some number like 750,000, I think it's not so much the actual number as the fact that we've set a goal and said it's a good thing to have plug-in vehicles because they're a new type of industry where our auto industry can compete. They're clearly cleaner for the air and they're lower carbon for the planet. The competition isn't standing still either. Globally, we have standards, whether you call them carbon emission standards or fuel economy standards. Even the gasoline vehicles are gonna get radically more efficient. It's important to say not only is there a federal credit, there are state credits. California has a $5,000 one. There are some local credits, especially in air quality districts in California, and there are even some corporations that will incent you to buy a clean car. One of the most popular incentives, as it turns out, in California, a specific set of hybrids for several years were able to use the high occupancy vehicle lanes on the freeways with only one occupant because they were so fuel efficient. That program went away for hybrids, but it is coming in for plug-in vehicles. This Chevrolet Volt has to pass all of the same safety tests. Yes, it's an electric car, but you can take it through a car wash, you can take it through you know, roads with a foot of water on them, etc. They tested this car above the Arctic Circle. They tested it in Death Valley. This car has been through all of the standard development processes that any modern automobile goes through. So there are really two questions that people ask. Number one, if we start plugging in cars, is it gonna take down the grid? 
And the answer is no. Um, number one, plug-in cars are going to come slowly and predictably. They're just a tiny fraction of the market, and they'll be that for a while. N number two, a plug-in car doesn't actually take a ton of power. Um, charging on 120 volt current, it's the equivalent of three or four plasma TV sets. It's not that much. Even if you had a substantial portion of the miles driven in this country, driven off grid power, assuming that you charge the bulk of it at night, you don't need to add a single new power plant. The second question is, aren't I just displacing the pollution or the carbon? And the answer is yes, but when they ran the numbers, wells to wheels, the answer is, even if you charge this volt on the dirtiest grid in the country, if you're comparing to a 25 mile a gallon car, which is about the average, um, you are better off burning dirty coal, turning it into electricity, charging this car and driving a mile on that, than you are burning gasoline. You still have a lower overall carbon number. Burning gasoline is a remarkably inefficient process. Only about 25% of the energy in a tank of gasoline actually turns into torque that turn your wheels. The rest is wasted in heat and noise. Electric is simply a better and more efficient way to move.